Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Quick note before we begin, the Finding Genius Foundation, as part of the Finding Genius Podcast, has recently completed a book about understanding viruses. So the creation of this book was to interview a 100 virologists, ask them a lot of deep, difficult questions, take the most difficult questions, and then re-interview the top 25 or so and ask them the hardest questions I could think of. And we compiled that all into a book. So you'll see question and four or five experts' answers. Question, four or five experts' answers. There's about 30 questions in the book. I think it's a great read for the layperson and for the researcher. It talks about a lot of speculation in the world of viruses, such as are they alive or not? And why is it important? Uh, why do viruses go latent or hidden or uneffective or sit in a person or an animal or another creature for weeks, months, years, and then suddenly become virulent and affect that person? Uh, so there's a lot of really provocative questions in the book. It's now on Amazon. So if you go to Amazon and type in Finding Genius, you'll see the book on viruses. It's also on Kindle. The Audible version is in production and should be ready in approximately a month. But if you want to go and order it now, uh, you can do so, again, by going to Amazon or Kindle or go, go to FindingGeniusFoundation.org and go to Publications. There's an opportunity as well to get the transcripts of all the interviews and to hear the original interviews themselves. If we had put them all together, the book would be about a 1,000 pages, but we condensed them down to make it juicy and concise and tight and very interesting. So I hope you'll check out the book. Uh, we're now working on one about cancer, but this is going to be our goal is uh, three times a year to come out with these masterclass books that I think will inspire new scientific research, and I hope you'll check it out. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have Dr. Nasha Winters. Uh, she's a physician and an author. We're going to talk about uh, the metabolic approach to cancer uh, from survivor to physician, which is the story of uh, her life and her book. So we're going to get into it here. So Nasha, thanks for coming. Thank you so much, Richard. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Well, tell me about your journey. I've spoken to dozens and dozens of people that, you know, had a condition. They were told they were crazy. They worked to overcome it. They did. Now they're helping others. And I would guess maybe that's your story, but what is it? Well, I love that. And that's true. I think it's definitely the good old classic pain to purpose um, story. Uh, I don't think anybody decides to go and jump both feet into the world of oncology unless they've had a very a close experience with it, either in themselves or a loved one, very near and dear to their hearts. So for me, it was my own experience. I had a lot of health issues from just sort of starting in this world. And I think that for me, I didn't really know wellness. I did not know what it felt like to feel good for so many years, but you kind of get used to it. You know, it's like being that little lobster in the cold water as they turn up the heat over time. And so by the time I was 19 years old, just shy of my 20th birthday, the last six months of that year, I kept ending up in and out of the ER and, you know, like with more and more pain, increasing digestive issues, increasing, you know, pain oh, patterns, man. you know, and they just, they just kind of kept a terrible age for that to happen to you too, because oh. you, you want to be carefree, you know? Oh, and yeah, it was like a, you know, it was, it was, a, I was my entering into my sophomore year of college. I mean, definitely not feeling what the rest of my peers were feeling and, and definitely trying to like still be a normal person while dealing with this was really tough. You know, it was like, I felt like I was living almost a dual life of here's my outside voice world. And here's my inside voice world. And finally, lo and behold, I ended up in the ER looking eight months pregnant, unbelievable in-stage organ failure, a bowel blockage, poorly perfused, really low oxygen rates, fluid built up in all the wrong parts of my body. And by the time they did some proper um, evaluation, they noted a huge mass on my right ovary and lesions in my liver and lesions all throughout my abdomen and lymph nodes. And that's when they determined with some other testing and some biopsies and fluid um, biopsies that I had in stage ovarian cancer, which was definitely a zebra, Jesus. right? That's, that's 1991. Crazy. It is crazy. And, you know, today I always tell people, you know, women getting younger and younger with cancer is, is quote unquote, not com It's not normal, but it's much more common. Back in 1991, it was neither normal or common. So that's why it eluded 
all of us for so long because I'd had years of IBS and endometriosis and polycystic ovarian syndrome and thyroid issues and brunettes and rheumatoid arthritis and celiac. So it just got kind of clumped into the big basket of my life and got just over overlooked far too long. So what did you do? I'm sure like your face <laughs> melted off and you thought that was the end. Well, and, and for me, I did think it was the end. They, they actually said I was too ill. My liver and my kidney function had completely gone into end stage. Like it was nothing, they weren't functioning. They were, I had, they were able to pull just a couple liters of fluid that first night in the hospital because they were afraid if they took all of it, they would kill me outright because of the fluid imbalance. My heart rhythm was in the 200s because I had fluid pressure built up around my heart and in my pericardium and in my lungs and in my abdomen. So they were really afraid. It was just like touch and go for a few days. And once that kind of stabilized, then they realized my organs were too beat up to actually take chemo. So there was no option. And for stage four, you don't jump right in to do a surgery because it's not quote unquote, life saving at that point, typically, um, they were hoping to maybe do help me resolve the bowel blockage, but I kind of resolved that on my own huh. accidentally. You know, waiting you know that's that. funny. It's weird because you were so advanced. It benefited you that they couldn't do chemo and kill yeah. you. They couldn't do yeah. resections yeah. and mess stuff up. And that's, what's really strange, Richard. And like, here I am nearly, well, it'll be 30 years, October, 2021, since that fateful, when all the biopsy results and everything came back forth, they knew it was cancer. They didn't know what kind, but by the time all the, the stuff, the data came in, they're like, yep, it's you know stage four ovarian cancer. And way back then we didn't have the level of pathology we know today, but we know it was a mixed presentation. There were mucinous compounds, there were papillary, there were serous, there were malaria. And so it was like what we probably call today an MMT form of ovarian cancer, which is also very, very aggressive and very non-responsive to Western medicine. So in some ways I would have been, if I'd even been diagnosed today, I wouldn't have had probably many other options given to me because of the nature of it. And probably the thing that saved my life was that I was unable to eat because of the blockage. So whatever I put in came back up or caused excruciating pain. And so for the next two and a half months, after they told me I had maybe three months to live, I couldn't eat. I couldn't do anything but tiny sips of warm water and then some tiny sips of herbal tea. And that is actually, Richard, I mean, now we have the research to kind of back what Dr. Moreshi's work of 1909 showed was that simple water fasting was enough to push back some of the cytotoxic burden. And so, of course, my scientific brain today can look back on that. I sure as heck didn't know that back then. I was simply not eating because it hurt and it made me sick. And so that was what sort of led to where we are, you know, one step, one little tiny foot in front of the other for the next 30 years, I sort of just stumbled around in the wilderness, finding my way, eventually learning a few things and eventually applying it to, you know, thousands of other patients and eventually consulting with doctors and researchers about how to apply this in other ways. So it's been quite a, quite a 30 year ride. So so you, you literally fasted for how long? About two and a half months, just shy of two and a half months. What was that like? I mean, what what was observed? Did you go in for more scans and did they see like the tumors retreating or what happened? That's a great question. So what happened then was, you know, everyone had kind of written me off for dead. But in my college, I had a little health center and there was a little private family practice in town that were able to do ultrasounds. And then I was able to order MRIs. At that time, that's what we used were MRI scanning equipment. So I was getting blood tests and MRIs about every three months. But I was qualitatively starting to feel better. The pain was getting better. The the fluid in my abdomen was going down. I'd had a total of eight and a half liters pulled over a matter of weeks because it would fill up and they pull out more and fill up and pull out more. And then it just really kind of slowed down. And I started to actually put on a little more muscle mass because I got terribly sarcopenic. My muscles really broke down really quickly. And I started to do my research. I was pre-med. I had a, you know, bio-curious mind, um, using my friend's coin term um, of bio-curiosity, but I was you know, a pre-med major, so I also worked in the library and stumbled across the work of Otto Warburg, all about the Warburg theory, um, mitochondrial being the basis of cancer versus a genetic issue. I also ran across the work of Dr. Beauchamp, who was sort of the I don't say the adversary, but you know the, the 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 person who was happening doing his research at the same time with Louis Pasteur and was talking about that it's not the germ causing the problem, it's the terrain in which that germ lands in that causes the problem. And these two things resonated with me, despite what I was learning 
in my pre-med advanced physiology, anatomy, biochemistry, organic chemistry, you know, courses. And I, I resonated way more with that than I did of kind of the two hit theory of, of the time of what they thought cancer was as this complete genetic disease. And so that, those were just sort of these accidental places that I stumbled upon and kept doing my own research. And once I started to get past that three month mark, I was still here, started to feel a little bit better. I started to apply other things. I started tweaking my diet. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now back to the show. I started taking certain supplements that I would learn about from, you know, my reading. There was no Dr. Google, so there was no way to go on and, you know, read all the stuff, which is overwhelming today. In fact, I will say very honestly, I think I was very lucky at the lack of information available to me because I think it's probably way more difficult when you're facing your mortality to have too many choices. Yeah. It wasn't nearly as bad as you, as bad as you, but I had thyroid cancer in 2017. And, you know, I could see when, yeah, when you think you're going to die and you're looking up stuff on the internet and there's some things where they say, oh, this is alternative medicine and most doctors won't do this or talk about it. It's, it's very difficult to believe. You don't know what to believe when you're in that state. You're very vulnerable, you know? Exactly. And that's, I think you nailed it. That word would be kind of the word of my life in that window of time was vulnerable on all levels, on my physiology, on my anatomy, on my psychology, on my spirituality, everything was just sort of on the br on the brink, you know, it's like, what, what is this? And I was also in a really interesting time in my life that I wasn't sure if I wanted to live. I'd actually been kind of actively trying to not live um, on several occasions for the time prior to that. And so in the moment when I'm actually faced with, well, here's your chance, you know, it actually was like a pilot light for me that said, nope, actually I thought about it and I choose to live, you know, and I still didn't think that I was going to, but I thought I surely want to understand why I've gotten to this place. And as long as I'm comfortable and I sort of get to um, determine how I die, I'll be happy. And lo and behold, I'm still figuring that out three decades later. Yeah, no, that's amazing. What did the MRI show, though, as you went through the fast? Great question. So what it showed is that I still had lesions on my liver, still had lesions in my abdominal cavity. I still had the tumor on my ovary. They were not getting bigger. That was the biggest thing is they weren't expanding. And the fact that they weren't getting worse and that the fluid had dried up and that my I was able to eat again, my bowel blockage completely resolved on its own, had no need for intervention. Even today, small bowel blockages, we would typically even in a hospital setting, just do a bowel rest, basically nothing by mouth. And they usually give the patient anywhere from three to 10 days. Um, to do that. And if it doesn't resolve after 10 days, they usually go in with a surgical intervention. Well, I wasn't being monitored in that way, way back then. So I have no idea when it finally resolved because I was so petrified of eating then because of the extreme pain and the extreme nausea that it would create that I just sort of went and went and went. And after the first few, maybe the first week, my, my appetite had completely gone away anyway. And I actually just started to feel better and better and clearer and clearer and probably the best. I had felt in years, which sounds really wow. ironic to people, but that's what happened for me. And um, I've had that experience with fasting since. I actually incorporate a lot of fasting in my life, even to today, um, in different ways. I've never done that kind of fast. The, the longest fasts I've done since then were a good 10 day water fast. You know, I don't push it beyond that, but I'm, I actually do three, three day water fast every month I and mean, maybe a wow. five to 10 days um, annually just for like a reset. And then um, a few years after my diagnosis, when I still thought I was going to die because everyone's like, well, the cancer is still there. Cause that was, you know, in Western medicine, that's what we focus on. We focus on what is seen on the imaging and what's seen on the, the tumor marker and my tumor well, marker. What, what, what was yeah. seen? Yeah. Like in the yeah. imaging with the tumor smaller or what was literally seen? They didn't get smaller for about three years. 
but they didn't grow during that time at all. And so what was problematic for me is about six MRIs in, so about a year and a half into the process, again, everyone was like shaking their head as to how and why I was still alive. But then they would all sit there and get my results back and say, you should be dead. It's just a matter of time like that. It didn't matter that I was still here and already had bypassed their expiration date. That's all they could tell me. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. So they it still sounds like, uh, like Malfoy from Harry Potter was caring for you. We'll get you next time. Potter. Really? You know, they weren't happy that you were still alive. You know what? That's so weird that you say that because I started to feel that way over time. And I was like, I mean, shouldn't you guys just be sort of like, I don't know what you're doing, but keep doing it. Or isn't this amazing? (laughs) You know, and I started to recognize for myself at that time that I was turning this into a manageable disease process. And it was no longer about me eradicating the tumors in my body. It was like, as long as I have quality of life, we can cohabitate for as long as it takes. So that was where my mind. When did that realization hit you? Probably about 18. Hey, when did that months, realization hit you? I would say 18 months to two years into the process. It was somewhere in that window. And, and part of that for me is I sold everything I owned because I still was like, it could happen tomorrow. You know, I could die tomorrow. And I was in this point where I was feeling well enough and safe enough to venture out. And I went on a seven month backpack trip. So before we got on this interview together, you had asked me about the origins of my name. And so I thought I'd go and you know travel around Europe and maybe go visit my namesake, which came from Turkey. And even though I'm not Turkish, and you know, funny story there later, but but ultimately I thought, well, I'll go see these things before I die. And it was exactly on my travels and meeting other healers and meeting other uh, people who were also traveling because they were given a terminal diagnosis for whatever reason. And just like getting out of my, my way, getting out of my comfort zone, getting out of all the things that I knew. That's when I think I realized, wow, I have a lot more influence on this outcome than I've been led to believe. And it just led to a deeper and deeper curiosity to explore all of the whys of where I was. And it really invoked in me uh, this sort of scientific evaluation. And I started gathering the metrics for myself from different lab tests. And, and, you know, just like I would see Chinese medicine practitioners and Ayurvedic practitioners. And I lived and worked in the four corners of the U.S. and worked with uh, shamans from Navajo and Ute, Southern Ute. Uh, traditions and Mexico guananderas and we chill medicine men and people in, you know, India, um, Indian, you know, ancient healers and Greek ancient healers. I started experiencing everything. Plus I'm a science geek. So I'd meet all these amazing oncologists and oncology researchers. And my husband, boyfriend at the time, now husband was a cancer drug design and grad, you know, in grad school and got into that because of a strong family history of cancer. And so we just had this, like our, our world became very cancer driven of what we were exploring all the ins and outs of it from every perspective you could possibly imagine. And we kind of just felt like I was carrying like a, like pushing a shopping cart and just like taking things off the shelf. I'm like, well, that's interesting. Let's try that. You know, it and, sounds and- like your, uh, your knowledge was proliferating out of control. It was definitely just like my cancer wanted to, my knowledge outpaced the proliferation of the cancer. And I think that was just the key. It's like, I'd learned something new about myself and sort of kick that can down the proverbial road just a little bit further. And then sometimes I made really bad choices. You know, I, I mean, one of the experiments I did is I would, I went from a very standard American diet, working at hot dog on a stick all through high school, living on cheese dogs and cherry lemonade. Um, you know, like that's, that was my diet. I was a latchkey kid, super poor, you know, poverty level poor, where we just lived on processed non-real food to becoming a vegan and a raw food vegan who suddenly was eating more vegetables than I'd eaten in my entire life, which was definitely a huge upgrade. But you have to remember, I was so malnourished at that time, both from my previous diet and then my cancer diagnosis. And then two and a half months of fasting that I had like no, like I was just like a string bean of, you know, like no muscle mass whatsoever. And what I ended up doing is I also became like a soy junkie 
and destroyed my oh, yeah. thyroid, destroyed my endocrine system, destroyed my gut. It really fired up all of my microbiome issues. Again, back looking back now, I understand what's happening. It flared all my IBS stuff. It flared my rheumatoid arthritis stuff. I became really inflamed everywhere. My blood sugars were out of control. And that's when I kept going back to what I'd read about Warburg's. I'm like, I need to start to practice something differently. So I moved more into a vegetarian, but lower carb. And I still thought I was eating lower carb, but it was still way too much for what I needed to do to change my, to change my system. And then over time, I just kept evolving with it, trying things on for size and seeing how they fit me. And by the time I left medical school, I had tried all kinds of things from IV nutritional therapies, like high dose IVC to to, you know, different healing modalities, to different diets and different cleanses and different detoxes and, and quote unquote, all the things. And I kept with my labs and my imaging. And so ultimately I was just pleased whenever my um, scans showed stability and my uh, tumor markers weren't going up. And so kind of to your point, about three years into my imaging, I had to stop because the gadolinium destroyed my kidneys. And so- Oh, you mean the diet they, they yep. gave you each time they did an MRI? Yeah, I was going to say at some point the scans will, oh, will do you in, it. I'm sure. Yep. And they did, and they still do to this day. I have about a 30% and 70% function of my kidneys. And I've tried everything you can imagine to bring them back on track. So I have to be very careful and delicate and gentle with them. And so, you know, even to the, this many years later, but I feel like if that's the worst of it that I got from that experience, so be it. My last scan was, let's see, I'm trying to think of the year 1999 was the last time I did any, any conventional imaging. And my, well, let me liver- guess any, any medical person you tell this to is like, oh my God, you need to get scanned. And totally. forget about the fact that you're still alive, right? Exactly. That, and that's what was the whole trip was like that, Richard. The whole trip was someone like, you're still, you still have cancer, you still have cancer, you still have cancer. And after a while, I'm like, so what, so what, so what? I am feeling well. I'm living well with it. We're cohabitating nicely. Um, and so I stopped the scans and because of just the damage on my kidneys, even the CT scan that my last one I had in 1999 destroyed because it, the, that it wasn't gadolinium. It was another contrast dye that really shut me down, put me almost into stage four kidney failure. That's when I'm like enough of this BS. There's got to be other ways. So I started using things like ultrasounds. Later, I started using thermography. Today, I use things like um, a, a, a higher, like a, a more modernized, more sensitive, specific form of ultrasound, as well as um, we'll be getting my first one this coming summer of something called pre which is like the next version of an MRI without contrast and without radiation that is just as sensitive and specific as many of our other imaging technologies out there without causing my body harm. And I've been using this in dozens and dozens of patients over the last two years and have been very impressed with what I'm able to see. And so that will be something just, and that's where we need to go into. What what is this again? Pre Nuvo. You want to get those guys on your website. Yeah. So pre Nuvo, P R E N U V O dot com. Summer of 2019, I was listening to a Peter, Dr. Peter, Peter Adia podcast, and he was interviewing this Dr. Oh, Ardia yeah, I like Peter, too. I, yeah. Right. And so I was listening and he was interviewing this really interesting Dr. Raj um, Ardiavala. I know I'm probably slaughtering his last name out of um, Vancouver, British Columbia, a, a radio oncologist. So an MD radio oncologist and a PhD, I believe, chemical engineer who basically said, we can do better on imaging. We don't have to keep poisoning our patients with radiation or the contrast dye because you noted it, you nailed it. Once we get past a certain threshold with those images, we are imaging techniques, we start to cause more harm than good. So just an example for your listeners, um, several research you know, has come out to say that five CT scans in your lifetime are as much radiation as they got exposed to with Hiroshima. So you don't really want to absolutely take a known carcinogen which is radiation that much. Like you don't want to saturate your DNA that much. So I was listening very, you know, like intently on this conversation, thinking it was in research only when I'm listening to their interview and realized, holy cow, this is happening in Canada right now. And so I I literally sent like that week, I think five or six patients to Vancouver to get imaged just to kind of like, okay, let's see how this goes. And they were willing, they had the cash to pay out of pocket. It's about, it was about $1,800, I think, for a full body scan, including brain imaging out of pocket, which for most people's deductibles, that's a pretty good deal, <laughs> you know, even yeah, out of yeah, pocket. Yeah. 
Um, um, and like a going rate of a regular MRI out of pocket's about the same in the U.S. So I, I was like, that's not re- terrible. Um, since then, like I said, I've had hundreds of, you know, probably hundreds of patients go to the point that they now have an imaging center in San Francisco, an imaging center in Minneapolis, another one getting ready to be done in the southeast part of the country, in the future in the mm-hmm. southwest part of the country, and they're working on one in Toronto and London. These guys are amazing. I'd love for you to get them on your show because they're looking at a very different, you know, they're, they've really taken the technology up a notch. And it's like, okay. this is where I get excited about the future of oncology is that we can do so much better than we're offering people today. And it's people, people like Dr. Raj, who is doing just that because imaging is important. And, but imaging that doesn't continue to make my patients sicker via the dyes or continue to make their DNA more vulnerable via the, the radiation, I'm all, I'm all in, you know? And yeah. so, that's well, where. Let me, let, me, sure. let me go back into your journey a little bit. Um, sure. You said you spoke to natural healers from you know one on one from a lot of different cultures. So, tell me about that. What was the experience like? What did they suggest? <clears throat> what did they say to you? Sure. Well, it was interesting because in that community, no one in standard of care ever asked me about my my trauma history, ever asked me about my like support systems, ever asked me about my mental emotional health. No one ever asked me that from standard of care. Right, not a one, because I, I, you know, part of it I think is I was so difficult to look at. Um, you know, the the man who diagnosed me in the ER that day who said this is cancer, we just don't know exactly what kind yet. He literally bawled telling me this because he had a 19 year old daughter. So I literally felt like I spent that that evening consoling him. Right, so I feel like that was. Yeah. And I felt like it was kind of par, uh, like a par for the course of like, no one knew what to do with somebody like me then. Um, and, and really they don't much more today, but unfortunately, as I said, it's way more common today, which is unfortunate, but that was one side of it. The other side of it is that, um, you know, in this process, no one wanted, like you said, when I was still here, they were like, they didn't know what to do with me. They just had, they didn't have a bucket to put me in. There was no way to even right. justify it. And then when I got about two and a half, three years out, then Richard, what happened is I got treated with animosity and rage. It was a very weird really? day. It was a very weird. Yeah. This is where you from who? So oh, when I would go in to get my, um, uh, I would go in every six months to have a, a, a every three months initially. Um, and then every six months and then annually thereafter. But in the beginning, every three months, a vaginal trans ultrasound, uh, transvaginal ultrasound. So I could look at the imaging from the inside out, way more sensitive and specific, no more radiation. So I could image what was in my pelvis and what was in my ovary. I also did an abdominal ultrasound to look at my, what was going on with my liver. And so that's what I started using for the ongoing piece of time. When I would go in there, when I would see them, they were, they would basically just say things like, you must have been misdiagnosed. You know, there's no way. And like, that must just be a cyst, like a polycystic thing on there or, mm. or that liver thing, just maybe a scar. Maybe you had a laceration, you know, it's like, mm. they couldn't even believe it despite that we had all the, like all the information. Now you just remember in 1901, I wasn't thinking about that. I'd be having a conversation like this 30 years in the future with you or right, writing a book right. about it or treat, treating thousands of patients. So I wasn't cognizant about collecting all my data. Then I didn't start collecting my data via labs and imaging and whatnot until probably the late nineties, early two thousands, because it didn't occur to me, you know, that this is going to be an amazing story someday because it was still so kind of embroiled into me that I shouldn't be here, that I'm going to die, that any second is my last. And that now I was even like questioning well, maybe I'm not like, maybe I was like, it was just all the things. It just, you started to feel crazy. So I just, yeah, planned, well, I'm sure. Yeah. And, and then when I decided I want to go to, you know, I, I'd already was on track to go to medical school. That was always the plan, even before my diagnosis, but I did not tell anybody. I was so petrified. They would not let me into medical school because of my diagnosis. Um, oh, I, I understand. Yeah. You know, and that actually makes, that makes pretty good sense. I can see why you'd say that, you know, because you were being treated. I mean, you're being gaslighted and treated like crazy. So yeah, exactly. So there's that. And then I'd also, I am not a victim, right? So that's the other thing is I do not want anyone to be like, oh, that's really sad. Like that actually drives me crazy. So I didn't want anyone like treating me differently. And then I didn't want to be like the cancer patient. I never saw myself, nor do I today saw myself as a cancer patient. I saw myself as a patient with cancer and Mm -hmm. our 
medical system has a very different, they want you to be the label. They want you to depend on that diagnosis. They want you to be afraid because it drives the whole narrative and it drives the whole treatment and it drives, a, you know, a trillion dollar industry. We just hit the trillion yeah. dollar mark. And so I was not amenable to, I was like, not, I'm not into that. And so right. for the first years I had, a, the only people who knew were my physicians at our, at our teaching clinic. I had one physician that was my you know, my physician who maintained and supported me and watched everything. And I had a handful of very, very, very close friends. And my boyfriend, now husband at the time, clearly knew. Um, that was really it. I, I didn't even tell my family for the first two years because I didn't want them to have any say in what I was doing and why I was doing it. And, and just to be really frank, my family would have made it about them and that would have killed yeah. me. And so I was in a family fast for two years. I didn't want anybody to know. And I was not wanting to be in a place where they're like, your cancer is really stressing me out. I, I couldn't deal with that. So <laughs> I'm just, you know, it's my, it's my cancer, not yours. Fuck off. Exactly. Yeah. But of course they would have made it theirs. And so there were so many elements to this that I was like, I got to lock this down. And then by the time I got into medical practice and was still here, I swore I'd never treat cancer. I was like, that is never going to happen. I, I want cancer out of my rear view mirror as quickly as possible. Right, right. Yeah, you never want to think about it again. Yeah, right. My first year in medical practice in 2000, you know, my first person who comes in is coming in for pain management and say, you know, and, and like, in, and they're saying he's coming in for pain management end of life care. I didn't know the diagnosis. I knew nothing until he came rolling in in a wheelchair and I saw the um, parietal skull bulged out. And I recognized right away that he was dealing with a massive brain tumor. It was so mm. massive that it had shut down his ventricles. They were completely closed on his scans. I couldn't believe he was alive. No one could. He couldn't talk. He was in excruciating pain. No amount of pharmaceuticals helped. Um, there was nothing they could do. They sent him to hospice. We were there to help. He was in a wheelchair. He was in a diaper. You know, it was like the worst quality of life you could possibly imagine. So yeah. at that time, I was like, well, I've got a couple of tools. Uh, oh, he was having seizures that were completely unresponsive to any of his medicine. So that's when I dusted off my old books. And I remembered this whole thing about ketogenic diet for epilepsy. There was nothing right. in 2000 about how we use this in brain tumors today, which is, you know, is moving into becoming standard of care. But back then... No. Right. And I couldn't even, if I put that in his chart, that would have backfired. So I'm like, we're going to put you on this low carb, high fat diet. We didn't even call it a ketogenic diet. His yep. seizure stopped within two weeks. First of all, the fact that he was still alive in two weeks was amazing. He was out of his wheelchair talking and the swelling was visually gone on his brain within two months. We were wow. using homeopathy. We were using acupuncture. We were using a, a ketogenic diet. That is it. He was continuing to get scans and his ventricles were still closed. And all of us shook our heads. Like, I don't even know. He cannot possibly be pumping cerebral spinal fluid right now. Or if it is, it's coming through a pen hole that we can't, you know, we can't identify. Yeah. Yeah. He lived another 18 months. Well, it was that moment where I realized, geez, Louise, apparently I've been given this, you know, opportunity. And then it just seems like the floodgates opened and people just started coming in from my tiny town, my tiny community. And by 2012, I had to close down my big family practice and just start focusing on cancer. Um, and that's where I've been focusing entirely for the past almost decade. Well, can we, uh, can we go back again? Mm -hmm. Like I said, these, these healers, you said they were from many countries. Oh, yes, yes. Apologies. What, yep. What did you get from them? What did they say? What did they do? Yeah. So what the, do you, you know, do you take what any of them did into your current practice? What is it? I love this. Well, another piece here is because in my town where I lived and worked, I worked in a detox center. And a, uh, at that time, it was still a residential alcohol and drug addiction center and, a, and the city detox. So I was a C, CNA or a, um, excuse me, a CAC, which is a certified addictions counselor. And I worked in that environment. And in that environment, because we had this residential detox, we had most of our community of our, our the patients through that, that program were native. And so they would bring in they're like kind of their own healers into the healing circle. So that's how I got exposed to some of these um, traditional healing practices. So I was invited into sweat lodges and I was invited into healing ceremonies and other things. I got to start to experience it. And over time, I kind of just got myself comfortably um, into the community in a way that they trusted me. I trusted them. I was in awe. I was very appreciative and respectful of their, of their ways. And they saw that they recognized that in me. And then they started to say, we see something in you and it, it feels important to share. 
right? So I can still remember yeah. the very first time I basically had this man say, there is a lot of poison in you. And he's mm. like, and he's like, it's not yours. It's not just yours. It comes from generations. This is what it is. It's what it looks like. It comes sure. from your mother's line, your grandmother, great grandmother. And it was just like this bolt of lightning through my body, you know, and then he's like, and then you've had a lot of assaults. And so he recognized all of the sexual trauma of my youth from a very, very young age, all the way into my teen years. Um, you know, wow, this guy recognized all this. Amazing. And, and, and I'm like, have, uh, oh, it was, to the core, you know? it was, it totally shocked me to the core. And the, the best part was I was a psych a psychology major as well as biology major. And so I'm in like abnormal psych and stuff. And again, no one's talking about this. And suddenly these guys are hitting on all of my wounds, like all the touch points and things that I wasn't ready to talk about things. I didn't even, a lot of things I just had buried that I didn't want to deal with. And yeah. it was also in my course because I, when I got so sick, I switched from a chemistry biology major to a psychology biology major. Cause I did start to recognize the impact of trauma. And so those guys helped me see it very much. And basically every time I travel to another place, I'd start to get people ask me about my relationships with my father or what happened to you at this date or what would like people were seeing things in me that no one else saw or asking questions in a way that I recognized they were seeing things. And it started me down sort of the uh, opening up the, the skeleton, you know, opening up the door to the skeleton closet and pulling everything right. out you know, and not easy. I had to find some pretty hefty therapy. I worked with a, uh, a brand new to my college, an EMDR practitioner, rapid eye movement practitioner. I was like her first patient in, in, you know, um, 1992, I was diagnosed in October, 1991 and started working with her, I believe in February or March of, of 1992. And I think that that was a huge part because she was helping me literally process the trauma in real time as it was coming up. It was burbling to the service because I was in these environments where these people were like calling it, you know, putting their finger on that, like putting their finger in the wound, not just picking the scab off. Right. And so that was right, happening. Yeah. And then, so when I started traveling, when I took off for that seven months, people would ask me like, well, what kind of trauma and what kind of background and what kind of support system? They would just ask questions that were never asked to me of the standard. And it just got me thinking. And then the other piece of this, you know, just quickly for your listeners, I was able to work in these communities with using some of their plant medicines as well. So access to things that I believe helped me create the BDNF, the brain derived neuro, you know, neurotrophic factor that helped me see another way, helped me see another um, possibility to my circumstances helped me start to access other parts of myself if, that were sort of like previously unknown to me and helped me move out of a lot of my trauma program programming. And so again, the timing was so extraordinary because in my studies, since I had switched over to psychology, I started to read about the work from Candace Pert and Bruce Lipton and Robert Ader. And basically what was it, late eighties and early nineties, the sort of evolution of this process called psycho neuroimmunology. So once I started to realize that I basically self-constructed my major to that of a psych psycho neuroimmunology. And for what me, is that? psycho is neuroimmunology that? is like the concept of where our thoughts and our um, emotional and traumatic experiences impact our physiology and our biochemistry and our mm -hmm. epigenetic expression. And of course, epigenetic expression was another decade down the road, you know, before I started learning, diving into that cool pool, because there's a lot more little nuggets of wisdom that I started learning then. But ultimately, that is also the time when the ACE score started to be presented, adverse childhood events. And it's a 10 question questionnaire asking about 10 events that happened before you're, before you were 18 years old. And so people can down, just got Google ACE score, or ACE questionnaire. It's everywhere. There's, I mean, it's like so well documented now. It's so understood and elucidated in the issue, in the literature. We know it drives up like the higher the ACE score, um, the higher your rate of cancer, chronic illness, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, et cetera. Like it's well, like they've studied it in pretty much all chronic illnesses. And there's an incredible, it's not just, you know, the con question of correlation versus causation, you know, causation correlation dance here. It's been really well elucidated. And what I learned about myself in taking that quiz is I was a 10 out of 10 on the ACE score. And basically what that translates to is that I was going to be effed um, in my adulthood if I didn't start working on, you know, like no wonder I got cancer. It was an absolute certainty that that was going to happen. And now really? the only way, yep. 
And now the only way out of this is for me to jump right into the pit and clean it up and change the experience. And for me, some of those plant medicines were what made it tolerable and safe for me to do so. Yeah, I was going to ask you, right, they, you've continued on your journey since then. So are you able to legally incorporate some of the, the modalities and things that you've used to help yourself? Or what, like, what are you able to incorporate? What yeah. can't you incorporate that you'd like to? Sure. Well, you know, in the last, uh, since 2012, I was able to incorporate, get my patients in clinical trials at places like Harvard for um, psilocybin studies for end of life care. And I still have many of those patients with us still today who were basically going through the PT, they're going through the end of life care psilocybin studies to help them come to terms with their mortality and die easier. And the irony is it basically helped them live easier. And so I have like, hopefully stories, people will write their books about these experiences because they're, they're out there. Those trials are still happening. We have eight um, different academic universities that have ongoing studies in just psilocybin. We have lots of studies in ketamine. We have lots of studies in NMDA. We have lots of studies in um, some of the other plant medicines. But what I did also is I had an opportunity to take a group of terminal patients in February, 2016, um, and take them down to Mexico and work with a Weechal medicine man. And all of these folks had, you know, they were in hospice. They were given six months to live or less. And they were all introduced to a peyote um, ceremony experience and had a healing with the um, Weechal medicine man. And they're all still here. <laughs> they're so all are still- you saying, so is your line of thought, so let's say, um, yeah. you know, I was abused when I was a kid and I'm like, 40 years old and I have, you know, a certain cancer is, is part of the required and necessary therapy to get rid of those childhood traumas. Otherwise I can't heal. Like how how much of that is a truism in terms of what you think? I would say it's a hundred percent a truism. I would say you cannot heal from the soil in which you got sick unless you pluck out all those weeds. And that's just been my personal experience for my own journey, but that of the thousands of patients I've had the absolute privilege to serve And my patients that were really, really challenged with facing some of those parts of themselves. Now, we don't jump right in and say, that's where we start. You've got, we start with the tangibles. We start where people are like, oh, I can do a supplement. I can run some blood tests. I can change my diet. I can start to evaluate the toxins in my home and my community. Most people don't want to start with, you know, what happened in your childhood or what, you know, what, what's on your mind. What does that have to do with this? Exactly. Exactly. But luckily I've been out there enough and my story has been out there enough and my book's been out there enough. Then now people come to me looking, they're like, I want you to help me go there. But in the beginning I could never, you know, like when you're just a nobody and you're getting out there, I had to gently help people through that journey. And, and because I'd been on that journey and was continuing on that journey and continue today on that journey, um, I had great compassion and, and understanding of like, this will come up and be addressed as it needs to be. But I also have had the experience where I've had patients who literally it was far too painful to address that head on um, than it was to to choose to live. And so uh, if that makes sense and that they basically chose the exit route and and I had that opportunity as well. I had the opportunity to choose the exit route and I chose, I chose differently. And that's where this is, this is really interesting. So what percentage of people in your experience, they're, their childhood experiences are so bad, so painful that they literally would rather die and not know versus confront it. It's a really good question. And it's something that I hope to study further, you know, in my, in my career, it's something that it's so near and dear to me personally and professionally. I've seen it so much. I'd like to actually conduct a really broad, you know, wide and deep study and evaluation of this, because I think that there's something to it. If I had to guess of who makes this, my, my, the, the good news is this, most people faced with their mortality are shocked into the, 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 like this, like reawakened into a deep desire to live for survivorship. And, and that's what is so beautiful about working with this community is that the majority of the time people recognize the opportunity that that cancer brings them and they recognize that it's a, it's an opportunity to heal in all aspects of their life and in a way they've never known possible. And, and even in those moments where we may not be able to physically change the situation, 
even as they're taking their last breath, I've seen some of the most amazing complete healings you could possibly imagine. And I know that's a little bit um, esoteric for you and your listeners to maybe hear, but I've, I've literally in, in well, a, what's an example, what, what oh, are some examples that shocked you? Yeah, well, I have an example of what uh, it's going to be published in a book here in September of this year on my use of mistletoe. And it was a young man in his 40s who had his um, nine at the time that he was diagnosed with end stage colorectal cancer kind of snuck up on him. I mean, literally kind of like me with my thing. It's really like it's going yeah. on. He's lying, he had a couple of years of digestive stuff. And then all of a sudden it's everywhere. It's exploding. He's massively a sight. He's dying. Um, I start working with him and basically find out that two years prior to his diagnosis, his daughter was taken away from him, wrongfully and erroneously accused of being um, uh, of molesting her, even though he swore yeah. he hadn't, and was embroiled in a very toxic, apparently the ex-wife was incredibly narcissistic and a bit psychotic and all these things. And he and his daughter were very, very close. And this was his, you know, it was a relationship that the wife didn't want to end, but he did. And her retaliation was to do this. And yeah, so it, it was very horrible. And it, and it um, turned into a very aggressive cancer. And the interesting thing is Western, he did surgery initially to, to open up a bowel blockage, but again, he was too sick and too far gone and they put him into palliative care, but in him finding me three months later, his scans were clear and he was doing great. Um, and was starting back into some, he kind of found his mojo to get back into the legal battle with his daughter um, but then put down everything else he was doing. It's like, he'd come, he got scared enough to do something. And then he like, so he's like, I'm good now. And then basically went back to the way it was. So Ooh. that was August, 2000, uh, two, let's see, 2000, well, I think it was 2013 fast forward. He maintained that for over a year until fall of 2014. And then the cancer came back more aggressively and more explosive. And at that time he lost his stepfather. It was getting uglier with his wife. He had not seen his daughter now for several years. He'd broken up with his girlfriend. There was just like all shit hit the fan. I mean, really, there's just like, it was so bad and it exploded again. And again, he got back into the program. Again, he was able to get into remission for another year. But every time he would get better, he would basically stop everything, keep going. And he wouldn't really deal with the emotional trauma. He just was so focused on sort of the tangible stuff. Like, I got to get my daughter back that he kept basically killing himself every time he denied the trauma that he was experiencing. And when we dug a little deeper, he had a lot of childhood trauma. His mother was extreme alcoholic, completely non-functioning, hard, hardcore narcissist. And he had to depend on her entirely during this time. And that also, it's like, he had to go back into the cesspool of his childhood just to be able to try and save his own child. And so yeah. in the very end, when we got him back in remission one more time, and then it came back with a vengeance three months later, so bad that finally his ex-wife finally realized she actually kept saying that he was even faking his cancer diagnosis and his treatment. That was horrible. And that was like, the whole, it was even worse. They're like, well, then we're not going to let him because he's a pathological liar. Well, when she finally realized he was literally dead and literally or dying and on, on that, she wrote a letter of apology to the police to the social workers, to the state of Colorado. She wrote a letter to the federal pedophilia database. And she basically recused her. She basically said, I lied. These never happened. He did not do these things. And in the last two weeks of his life, he got to spend almost every day with his daughter. And I never saw him happier. And I watched him die the most beautiful, beautiful death you can imagine. And right. he was completely at peace. It took everything. And so those are some, I mean, it's a very crazy, drastic example, but I've seen yeah, many, yeah, yeah. many like that. And it's just that place that he just couldn't, you know, move through. And it's like, that was such a thing out of his control, but he could have controlled how he reacted to it. And he could have found some other ways of like how he could have supported himself or gotten someone to support him through it. But he was very stoic in his nature and very torn up by that. So it was a really crazy experience, but I've seen that several times. I've seen like a woman, I remember, I'll never forget who, it was so painful. The, the infidelity of her husband um, was so painful for her that it, it became a, a cancer process. And it was the, for her, it was the only place he basically like came like the cancer basically gave her the ability to basically control him because now he felt guilty and now he was apologetic and I want to stick around and before her cancer. He was basically screwing around on her all the time. And so for hmm. her, when we got her, well, he started sleeping around again. And so she had a quick recurrence and for her, it was way easier to stay sick 
and choose to die versus to leave his ass and get the much needed husbandectomy she should have done at the first time she had her diagnosis. That was really painful to watch as well. Those, those are just some really extreme examples. And there's a lot more backstory to these stories, but, but yeah, those are the things that I saw, you know, like over and over, but for the most part, Richard, what I think is so beautiful is especially if someone's had cancer once, because Western medicine makes it like, no worries. We'll just cut it out. We'll just throw a little chemo in the mix. We'll do some radiation. You'll ring the bell and you'll go on with your life. And yet what they don't tell the patients is that 70% of the time you'll have a recurrence. So most patients who come and find me, it's when it comes back. And at that time, they're like, you know, fool me once, shame on you, you know, like that whole thing. And they're like, fool me twice, shame on me. And that's when they start to say, I need to take a different approach, you know, or they somehow stumble upon a podcast of me or somehow a friend gives them my book or somehow, somehow they're like curious to say, ugh last thing I want to do, but I see it now. I recognize it and I'm understanding they're reframing that they're not a victim to cancer, that the cancer is a messenger, <laughs> that it's like, what did it, and, you know, I'm known for my quote of what did cancer come to heal? You know, what did it come here to heal in you? You know, that's, that's really what it comes down to for many of my patients. And they, they tend to find it, you know, and it's quite, quite extraordinary. So what, what does your protocol look like? Well, it's not a protocol. I know it's I'm, I'm very everybody. much a, I'm an N of one um, kind of gal. And so I test, assess, address, don't guess is my mantra. I do extreme evaluation of their blood chemistries. I look at their uh, tissue pathology and their tissue tumor assays, their molecular markers. So I look at the targets in the actual tumor and tumor cells. I also look at their epigenetic blueprint. I look at what they were born with. I want to understand what in their genetics are they able to absolutely change? What are they able to manipulate through their diet, their lifestyle, their thoughts, their relationships, et cetera. I take a thorough history of their ACE scores. I do that ACE score questionnaire. I ask them a lot of hard questions. I ask them, what brings you joy? For what are you grateful? And what did you come here to do? What is your purpose? Um, People without purpose are very difficult to bring back into balance. So the purposeless patients are the ones that keep me up at night, you know, and I tell them that from the get-go, you need to find your purpose because even that, that's very prognostic. Um, I look at their home system, like if they're still in a toxic relationship or a toxic job, or they've not dealt with the loss of, you know, someone very close to them or, you know, some estrangement from somebody important in their lives, we'll never get anywhere. Like those are the things that just keep hugging them back into the same rotten soil in which they got sick. So that's so quick where question, I think, uh, yeah. quick question here. If, if standard of care doesn't work, you know, in terms of chemo, radiation, et cetera, what is standard of care psychologically? And then what is what you found to work better? I love it. Well, first of all, I think standard of care has, it has an absolute time and place. I just think it could be done better and it can be way more personalized and precise than it, than it currently is. You know, we take a very shotgun approach and a very generalist approach. And we're like, ah, oh, we'll start with this protocol. If that doesn't work, we do this one. If that one doesn't work, we do this one. It's like, why don't we start with the bullseye first instead of trying to work towards one? So that's my beef with standard of care is that we have the cool tools and technologies today to actually get a bullseye from people from the get-go. That's my long-term dream. As far as the, how do we deal with that sort of psychosocial, emotional, spiritual component and standard of care, we basically kind of placate someone and say like the integrative cancer centers that are part of um, academic universities of which there are about 76 of them in the United States right now that say they have an integrative oncology program. They may incorporate a little bit of um, you know, Reiki or a little bit of sound healing or a little bit of acupuncture. And those are all really beautiful, but they're really not accessing trauma. They're not accessing trauma resolution patterns. They're not accessing vagal nerve issues. They're not accessing endorphin in, in deficiencies or endocannabinoid deficiencies. They're not looking at people's epigenetic hiccups to see what their um, kind of propensities are towards mental illness or serotonin dopamine issues. And so many people get put on just SSRIs in the cancer world. That's almost goes with, it's like diagnosed and here's your script. Like that is pretty much how it's dealt with. And they might hand you over to maybe a social worker or two, but even then they're very talk head therapists. They, they just like to scooch the furniture around the living room. They don't really take patients on that journey. So I'd like to see a deeper, um, 
know, a deeper approach to that, that piece of health offered in standard of care, which I think is also luckily thanks to people like Michael Pollan's book, how to change your mind. Mm-hmm. Luckily with, with um, legalization of marijuana in the United States in the last few years, a lot of these concepts we can talk about a little bit more freely. There's really powerful groups out there and, and veteran groups doing post-traumatic stress disorder studies with ketamine and psilocybin and acid and other things that they're able to do in a very, you know, controlled research environment with really nice outcomes. So I think that we're starting to find a role where we can use some of these ancient therapies in a very modern applied way that can really enhance um, the patient's experience as well as as possibly improve their outcomes and definitely quality of life and perhaps progression-free survival or overall survival rate which is what the studies are, are tending to show. So I think yeah. we've, we, we, I, I see it on the horizon. Let me show that hopeful side of it that I think in the next 10 years, because what I've watched happen in my own career path, you know, the first 25 years, I felt like I was on a tiny little island on a tiny little soapbox, the tiny little, like, you know, um, oh, what are those little like cheerleading things you like yell into, you know, it's like this tiny little oh, like megaphone. Or yeah, like megaphone. Yeah, my tiny little megaphone all alone and no one can hear me. In the last five years, that's changed. It's like all these little islands are finding each other, starting to link up and we're kind of becoming more and more unified. And there's a lot more patient driven requests to have a better experience in their medical care, especially in the cancer world. So I've been saying these things for decades, you know, my colleagues, the researchers I've worked with, but really the people who are changing it now are the patients because they're demanding something different. And, and luckily there are more and more doctors getting interested in studying these things and applying these things, or at least working with and referring to people who know these things, that now the patients, basically their dollars are talking. And so there'll be a time, I, I, I hope and pray in my lifetime, that you basically um, will, will it, if you have a doctor you're not pleased with, who's not interested in taking you on these deeper dives into your terrain um, and into your healthcare journey, there are, there, are, there are a dime a dozen elsewhere. So just step off that yeah. you know, train and go elsewhere, like fire them and move on. Um, and so I, okay. I'm seeing that start to happen, which is super exciting to me because it, it's, it's about like, hopefully you're hearing me say, it's not doing alternative or standard of care. It's about doing the best and most sort of repurposed and personalized standard of care with the most vetted, you know, personalized integrative or alternative therapies together, bringing both of those together. Because a lot yeah, of times, really like, yeah, when you got online looking for your thyroid cancer, like you saw every recommendation, like this diet and this supplement, and this, that's crazy. And no wonder standard of care hates alternative medicine. But the same thing happens. It's just as bad on the other end of the spectrum. When someone just gets in, they're like, oh, we're just going to take out your thyroid. We're going to give you our RAI. Right, and then yeah, we'll just yeah. watch your, th- your TSH for the rest of your life. And you're like, that's it. That's it. Like, like what else? And, you know, they don't even ask like, well, why did you get thyroid cancer? And da, 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 da. you know, like over, over 90% of thyroid cancers are papillary carcinomas, which are secondary to Hashimoto's, which is driven by celiac, you know, like gluten sensitivity that just fires up those thyro um, TPO and thyroglobulin antibodies. And it's like, why is that conversation not out there? Because it's elucidated in all the literature and all the science. So when I basically start treating my thyroid cancer patients, but I'm on a hundred percent gluten-free diet, even grain-free for a period of time till we get their autoimmune under place. We watch, keep watching their anti- your thyroglobulin antibody test for our marker of cancer. We clean them up. If they had RAI, we get them on the right dosage of their meds for them. Then they live a long, healthy life. And I've never lost a papillary cancer patient to, you know, cancer. They live with it beautifully forever. Right. So those those are the weird things. Like, why are we not having these conversations? I'm not taking away from standard of care. I'm making it work better. It it makes their outcomes look better. So that's what I like to see. I I think, I think standard of care says no thanks, unfortunately, but I know what you mean. You know, and that's well, where I, well, very I good. patients are going to ask for something different. Patients will demand yeah. it. <laughs> so yeah, there well, you go. Good. Dr. Nasher, we're, we're out of time, but do you do telemedicine? Where, where can people find you and where, if, you know, depending on where they come from, can they work with you? Sure. So today I no longer work directly with patients, but I do work with their doctors. So I do doc to doc consults on the patient's behalf. You can find that at Dr. Nasha, D-R-N-A-S-H-A.com. Go under patient resources and you'll see all that way. 
I'm also training physicians now all over the world who do what I do and, and use the methodology that I have. And we're also collecting our data. We're working on a really powerful platform to show our data in real time, to show that it's reproducible and scalable and a lot of other cool things. So they can find me there, find out what I'm up to. They can also read my book, The Metabolic Approach to Cancer and follow me on Facebook and all the other social medias under Dr. Nasha Inc., on Instagram and LinkedIn and all the, all the things. So I look forward to hearing from you and your viewers, and I'm really honored for the opportunity to share with you today. It was great. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate you coming. Thank you. All the best. And I look forward to sharing this with everyone. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.